So I think we can start. Uh, the, our first speaker is Michael Brennan from Waterloo, and he didn't write the title, so I'll have to tell you what it is. So he's going to talk on cross product equivalence of quantum autonomous groups. So please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, good. Okay, good. Yeah, so I want to, uh, first of all, thank the organizers, uh, Lisa and David, for, for uh, running a very uh, interesting and broad workshop, and also the general thematic program organizers for taking all the time to put together such a great program this, uh, this year. So, uh, yeah, what I want to talk about is uh, some joint work uh, with um, Floris uh, Elzinga, uh, Sam Harris, and Makoto Yamashita. So Makoto uh, is at uh, Oslo, Sam is at Northern Arizona, and uh, Floris was Makoto's PhD student, uh, now left mathematics and working in industry. Um, so uh, yeah, what I, what I really want to talk about today is, uh, I guess in a sense, in line with the theme of this workshop, uh, namely structure and symmetry and the interactions between uh, these things. And so what I really want to talk about are um, the structure uh, of certain quantum symmetries Uh, and the quantum symmetries I'm going to be talking about are going to appear as uh, compact quantum groups. And these are uh, quantum symmetries of very simple objects from the perspective of C star algebras, and they're going to be finite dimensional C star algebras. Okay. So these are the objects that I'm going to tell you about. So let me maybe just try and introduce this uh, uh, this this uh, these objects uh, kind of in a relaxed way or slow way. Or um, and, and really, what I want to do is I want to think about a finite dimensional C star algebra. So every finite dimensional C star algebra it'll be typically labeled by B in this talk. And of course, we can think of this really as having its natural, let's say direct sum decomposition. So this is going to be a finite dimensional C star algebra given to us. And uh, the, the question that we're interested in are really what are the symmetries uh, of B? And of course the answer uh, the natural answer here is, of course, the, uh, the group of automorphisms, the group of star automorphisms of B. So this is the compact uh, group of star automorphisms. Of B. Okay. And uh, So, um, <clears throat> so maybe by just just to think of some illustrative examples, uh, if B is uh, just uh, the n-dimensional abelian C star algebra, uh, then we know, of course, what the automorphisms of, of B are. The automorphisms of B are naturally identified with the uh, permutation group on n letters. Okay, so. That's essentially Gelfand duality, telling us that automorphisms of commuter C star algebras correspond to automorphisms of the underlying space, and that's just permutations here. Um, and another illustrative example maybe would be B, uh, kind of in the opposite extreme. Look at uh, just a matrix algebra MN, uh, and in this case, Uh, the automorphism group uh, is well known, right? Uh, automorphisms of MN, star automorphisms of MN, are exactly uh, uh, implemented by unitary conjugations, right? So this is the adjoint action 
or the image of the unitary group under the adjoint action. So UN is just the N by N unitary matrices and the unitary matrices act by conjugation, right? So, uh, and, and this is exactly all automorphisms. And in general, of course, uh, the structure is slightly more complicated, uh, but it's clearly some sort of compact matrix uh, group, right? So the automorphism group uh, can be thought of as uh, a closed subgroup of a certain finite dimensional unitary group, U. And what is this unitary group? Well, if you think of B as a Hilbert space with respect to a suitable inner product, and I'll tell you which inner product I'll choose. It'll be an inner product coming from a trace, tau on B. Uh, and what it is, is uh, uh, tau is going to be what it'll call the Plancherel trace. And of course, there are a few, you, you can make choices with this trace here. Actually, is this too low, by the way? It's too low, okay, sorry, yeah. So let me just uh, write this over here. Tau is going to be this Plancherel trace. Uh, and what it is, is tau, if I think of uh, B as having this kind of decomposition, it's uh, uh, sum over K of NK times the unnormalized trace uh, on the K block. Okay. So that's a trace you can put. It's a faithful trace, of course. Uh, why is this a nice trace? It's actually the unique trace uh, up to normalization on B, uh, which arises as the restriction of the unique trace on the endomorphism algebra of the vector space B. So this is somehow a very natural trace, and of course this kind of trace appears everywhere in representation theory and so on and so forth, okay? So uh, every automorphism will preserve this trace, for example. Yeah. 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 Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good. Yeah. So, um, right. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I, I could normalize this to a state if I wanted to. So it won't matter too much for this talk. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, this is the symmetries of a finite dimensional C star algebra. But what I want to uh, talk about are something more general. In the one for, for the n by n matrices, you're look, I mean, it's unitaries modulo the scalars, and you really expect you to have to quotient by something. something. Uh, that's right, yes. So, I mean, uh, you, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a subgroup, and essentially the subgroup you get here will be, like in this case, it will be the image of uh -huh. essentially u tensor u bar, right? So this will still be unitary matrix, and uh, okay. in that representation, you're sort of already modding out okay. by that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that center, yeah. Yeah, so in a sense, I mean, these are going to be unitaries acting on this Hilbert space, which in addition respects the multiplication involution. Yeah. You can really see these as unitaries. But uh, anyways, um, of course, another way to think about it is every star automorphism has a unitary implementation. So <laughs> you can think of it that way. So, and, and it will be implemented here, for example. So what are quantum automorphisms? Okay. Uh, so roughly the idea is uh, I want to look at the automorphism group, and in fact, I'm going to think about the functions on the automorphism group and, and look at a non commutative version of that. So, uh, the way I want to think about this is okay, so, um, right, so the automorphism group of B will act on B by its natural defining action. You know, this is a, a group which acts faithfully on B and is kind of the biggest one which does this, acting by star automorphisms. Right, so what does this mean? You're going to have basically an ordered pair uh, G in ought B and an element of our C star algebra B. That'll just get sent to G acting on B. And uh, 
if I think about this, uh, you know, in the language of Gelfan duality, this is really the same as looking at a map alpha from B into continuous functions on the automorphism group of B, tensor B. Uh, and what is this map? It just sends B to alpha of B. And what is alpha of B? It's an element in this tensor product. And if I think of this tensor product as really as functions from this group into B, this is um, alpha of B viewed as a function on G will just be G acting on B. So, uh, and, you know, so you can really sort of talk about the action at the level of algebras, okay? And what is this, uh, this alpha? This is a, a map, but it, of course, has lots of special properties. So alpha, so properties, alpha is a star homomorphism, in fact, a unital star homomorphism, okay? Um, two, uh, alpha is covariant with respect to the uh, trace tau that I've endowed B with. So what does that mean to be covariant? Well, of course, star automorphisms preserve this trace naturally, always. Uh, and um, at the level of alpha, what this is really just saying is that if I take uh, B, apply alpha to it, <clears throat> this is sort of, you think of this as sort of describing the orbit of B under G action, all right? And it's trace invariant, so what this means is I can take the identity map tensor of the trace and end up with trace of B times the identity function on C of the automorphism group. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, another way I want to just mention, right, so uh, I can write this map alpha this way, but if I think of, uh, let's say, fixing an orthonormal basis, or even just a linear basis, B, um, then I'm really sort of, you know, thinking of B as a vector space on which this automorphism group is acting by transformation matrices, okay? So then once you fix a basis, you're going to get coordinates uh, U, I, J, I, J going from one up to dimension of B uh, on uh, automorphism group of B, right? And this action uh, of automorphism group on B is really going to then be seen at the level of the coordinates. So alpha of a basis vector EI will just be sent to sum over J, UIJ tensor EJ. So this is really, you know, essentially seeing how the group acts by matrix multiplication relative to a basis, if I'm thinking of it as a matrix group. Okay. <clears throat> and essentially, yeah, uh, you know, uij will just be the uh, component of g dot b. uij at g will be the component of g dot b at uh, the basis vector ej. Okay, so, right. So this is uh, the properties we have. And uh, you can make an easy observation that actually the commutative C star algebra is actually universal among uh, commutative C star algebras with the following property.
Uh, so namely, uh, there exists uh, a unital star homomorphism, beta, from B into B tensor A. So now let me say unital C star algebra is A, OK? Such that uh, beta is tau covariant, OK? And uh, one more thing, namely some sort of faithfulness condition. Namely, if I think about beta actually being written in terms of our chosen basis, EI, let's say beta of EI is equal to sum over j u i j, no, let me say v i j now, tensor uh, e j, okay? These v, oh, sorry, I wrote a and b on the wrong side here, so this should be a tensor b, <clears throat> okay? So essentially, the map beta is going to be uniquely determined by essentially a dimension b by dimension b matrix of coefficients belonging to a, right, relative to a particular basis. Okay, and we ask that this map here define a tau covariant unital star homomorphism, okay? And then the final condition is we want sort of a minimality condition. So namely, the C star algebra generated by all the Vij's, where i and j run from one up to the dimension of b, this should be equal to a. Okay. okay, so what do I mean by it has a universal property with respect to this kind of uh, co-action or notion dual to an action? Uh, well, namely, the universal property is precisely that then there exists a unique star homomorphism pi from continuous functions on the automorphism group of B onto A, which sends uh, the matrix element Uij, the coordinate function on automorphism group of B, to Vij. Right? <clears throat> and you can see this uh, readily. I mean, if you just think about uh, every uh, character of this commutative C star algebra A, Right, if you take beta and you slice it by a character, that's gonna produce you exactly an automorphism of, of B, okay? And from that, you d immediately deduce that, uh, okay, all the characters of A are exactly automorphisms of B, so the spectrum of A will be a subset of the automorphism group of B, and so it will be a, cl a closed subset, and then of course, then you get that A is a quotient of, of the, this algebra. Okay. But my guess would be that it's automatic from the universal property that the the I is the generator. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. So you don't need any of the Yeah. I mean, so uh, I guess I could rephrase this. Um, yeah. I mean, essentially, the universal property should be that there's a, a surjective morphism onto the C star algebra generated by these things. Great. Okay, and uh, so what was the point of going through all this? Well, if you look at this, you can see that uh, this kind of construction, this universal construction, in no place actually requires C of ought of B to be a commutative C star algebra. And you can, re you can essentially just copy this definition down. Uh, uh, by insisting now, or, or rather essentially throwing away the requirement that A be commutative and that the universal algebra object here is commutative as well. And that's exactly how one arrives at the notion of a quantum automorphism group of a finite dimensional C star algebra. Okay, so uh, the idea, so uh, you, uh, I'm going to, maybe I'll skip a little bit of details, but we're going to do the same now. Uh, but don't require uh, 
to be commutative. Uh, and also, uh, of course, A as well. OK, so let me be maybe slightly more precise here. What I mean is I'm going to let uh, the following C star algebra and the quantum or non-commutative version will just I'll put a Q in front of ought, so Q ought of B. OK, so C of Q ought of B, this is notation. There's going to be no classical space underlying this anymore because it will be non-commutative. But this is going to be the universal unital C star algebra generated by <clears throat> the coefficients of a tau covariant unital star homomorphism Uh, alpha going from B into uh, <clears throat> uh, C of Q ought B tensor B. Okay. Right, so what does this actually mean, you know, in terms of an algebra with generators and relations? Well, Again, it's handy to write things in terms of bases. So remember, alpha, with, with respect to my favorite basis for B, right? if I think of alpha with respect to that, I can write alpha uniquely as alpha acting on a basis element EI as sum over J, uh, UIJ tensor EJ. Okay. So this alpha will be defined this way. And what do I mean by coefficients? These uij's are my coefficients of my action. Right? And uh, so what I ask for is that c of q ought b is going to be a unit of c star algebra generated by variables uij. 1 less than or equal to i, j, going from 1 to uh, the dimension of b. And then I have to impose all the relations on these variables, which make this linear map a unital star homomorphism, which uh, preserves the tr uh, trace tau that I've chosen. Okay, So we've got a whole long list of relations, which I won't actually write down. And of course, depending on B, the complexity of the relations changes. Okay, and the relations are exactly what I said, uh, uh, imposed by the properties of alpha. Okay, so the properties of alpha are exactly that tau should be or, uh, invariant under this map alpha. Uh, out this this map alpha should be a multiplicative unital involution preserving and so on. Okay. All right. So good. Um, so one thing one can check is that you know this universal object uh, in the category of unital C star algebras always exists. And uh, if you look at some concrete examples, like again. Consider the commutative algebra c to the n, okay? So here my EIs are going to be the, uh, the, the, part, the projective partition of unity, uh, which is the natural basis for c to the n, okay? So this is the projection value measurement basis, okay? So E1 up to En. Uh, and then you can, you know, play this game. So write down this map and then check, right? So alpha is a star homomorphism. Right, so what does that mean? Well, you get a bunch of relations. And, uh, yeah. So, for example, you'll get uh, U, uh, I, K times U, uh, J, K is equal to delta 
uh, i, j, u, i, k for all k. Okay, so that's the multiplicative property. Involution is just saying that these things are all self-adjoint. So the algebra is generated by a bunch of projections, uh, an n by n matrix of projections. And uh, you're going to get from trace preserving and unitality uh, that the rows and column sums of these generators is 1. So sum over i of uij is 1. And that's the same over if I sum over j. Okay. So if you just check all of the properties required, you get these universal relations right here. Okay. So if you think about this, if I put all these generators into a n by n matrix, of this algebra, this is what is known as a quantum permutation matrix. Uh, of size n by n. Okay, so if you look at these relations, these uh, tell you, you know, for example, if this algebra was the scalars, these relations would tell you exactly that you have a permutation matrix. Okay, these will be zero, one variables because these are going to be orthogonal projections in each row and column would sum up to one. Okay, so this really is uh, a kind of non-commutative version of functions on the automorphism group of c to the n, which is Sn. Okay, so uh, so the notation that's often used here is that the quantum automorphism group, and I'm saying quantum group even though I haven't really said what I mean here, but bear with me, I'll say something more in a minute. This is usually written as Sn plus, and this is the quantum permutation group. All right. Now, uh, let's look at our other uh, favorite example, a full matrix algebra. So if B is a full matrix algebra, again, classically, the symmetries of a matrix algebra is coming from the adjoint action of the unitaries on, on that algebra, so conjugation by unitaries. And quite interesting, something rather similar happens in this case. You can check, it's not, uh, Okay, it's a theorem actually due to Bonica. So Bonica proved the following nice result back in the late 1990s, which is the following. So if I let uh, uh, A be a unital C star algebra, okay, and U is going to be an n by n matrix in Mn of A. Okay, we call U a bi unitary if, as a matrix in the algebra MN of A, U and U transpose are unitary. Okay. So if you think about uh, the universal C star algebra, generated by the coefficients of an n by n unitary matrix, you get Brown's uh, non-commutative unitary algebra, which is uh, a well-known object. And uh, what we're doing here is we're really considering relations uh, coming from Brown's construction, together with some sort of symmetrization of it by requiring that the transpose be unitary as well. And that's, of course, not a guarantee for an operator valued unitary, okay? But uh, what's kind of interesting is, okay, I'm going to let C of U N plus be the universal C star algebra generated by the entries of uh, a biunitary. Okay, so basically I look at the relations imposed on the UIJs by requiring U and U transpose to be unitary. You get a bunch of quadratic relations. You get a universal C star algebra. I'll call this C of UN plus. This is some sort of like non-commutative version of the unitary group. 
of n by n matrices. And then something quite interesting happens. In a sense, in a non-commutative sense, un plus acts by conjugation on mn, and those are precisely the quantum symmetries of mn. So define. Uh, alpha from mn into uh, c of un plus tensor mn by the following alpha uh, of a matrix, well, I mean, actually alpha of x for a matrix x is just going to be u x, uh, one tensor x, u star. So remember, U is my matrix of generators. Okay, so U is this matrix of generators. And I can, by pushing MN into this algebra in the obvious way, just tensoring with one, I can now conjugate, okay? Uh, with respect to a basis, alpha of EIJ, this is going to be some sum over K and L if you do your linear algebra of like U, something like I, K, U, J, L star uh, times tensor uh, E, K, L. Okay. And what Bonica's result is that exactly uh, C of Q ot plus uh, of B of MN is exactly the C star algebra generated by U I K U J L, okay? Where J and I, J, K, and L run through uh, one up to N, okay? So if you look at this, this is exactly the same thing that you have for classical uh, automorphisms. It's now just that the unitaries are scalar valued. They're acting in this way on the basis matrix units. And the coordinates are exactly the order two products of the coordinates of the unitary group, okay? So this is really some sort of like algebra of functions on the projective version of un plus in a, in a kind of natural sense, non commutative sense. Oh yeah, sorry, but I will do this. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, good. Right. So these algebras, you know, for B, given by these two examples, they, they kind of look quite different. And in fact, uh, what we're interested in here now is really to study uh, these algebras systematically. All right, and in particular, I'm gonna be not only interested in this algebra, this universal algebra, but natural uh, uh, reduced or, uh, yeah, reduced versions of these algebras, quotients of these algebras relative to nice states, and also von Neumann algebra completions. Okay, <clears throat> and in particular, you might wanna ask, for example, how is the, let's say this C star algebra generated by these unitary coefficients of order two related to the algebra generated by these relations here. Is there any relation at all? Okay, so to understand uh, these objects, um, you really need to think about these uh, as quantum groups. So what does that mean? Um, so again, the automorphism group is a group. So the multiplication of these automorphism matrices, it's matrix multiplication, will induce a co-multiplication on uh, C of ought B. In the non-commutative case, of course, there's no underlying space on which there is a multiplication, but the co-multiplication formula passes through verbatim. So these uh, Q ought Bs, 
are compact quantum groups. And what does that mean? This means that there exists a uh, co-associative star, unital star homomorphism, uh, which is given by, well, maybe I don't want to erase that, uh, but I can't, no. Uh, all right. All right, so, so again, if I think about the, the uh, fixing a basis, U, uh, E, I for B, then I have the generators are given by these uh, generators, U, I, J relative to this basis. These are like the coordinate functions, non-commutative coordinate functions. And then with respect to that, it's exactly what you would see for matrix groups. So on generators, you can define this map. And by uh, constructions, it's automatically co-associative. And that just means delta, if I apply delta twice, I can do it two ways. I can do delta and then delta tensor identity. And that should, should not depend on whether I did identity tensor delta following delta. Okay. Right. So this is, again, you should think about this as, you know, if you were to pass co uh, multiplication in a matrix group up to the function algebra at the level of matrix coordinates, this is the map you would get. Okay. So this formula turns out to define a well-defined unital star homomorphism, uh, right? And where is it going? Delta is going from C of Q ought of B into its tensor square. All right, so what is this, what's the upshot of this? Well, one thing is this then uh, gives at your disposal uh, well, a lot of tools to study these objects. And in particular, you have a Haar state, H from C of Q ought B into C, A. And what is the Haar state? This is kind of like the analog of integration against Haar measure. And that means it's left and right translation invariant. Okay. So this is a tracial, uh, it turns out to be a tracial state in this class of examples. Okay. And that actually turns to be a consequence of the fact that I chose a tracial state on B tracial functional on B to begin with. If I was to choose a non-tracial uh, thing, I could repeat all of this construction. I would get a typically a non-tracial H. Okay. But in any case, once you have a Haar state, then you can, of course, talk about the reduced version of this algebra, which is going to be the uh, GNS image of this algebra the reduced, uh, the, the full one. All right, and then you can also consider the associated finite von Neumann algebra. Which is going to be just the double commuton. Of the reduced, okay. All right, now, so this is the reduced C star algebra, and this is the uh, von Neumann algebra. Okay. Now, if you look at the generators and relations of these algebras, you can kind of guess that you're getting some fairly, very non commutative algebras. There's a lot of sort of freeness uh, in the relations given by these algebras. And in particular, in a lot of examples, you can, for example, find the full, C, uh, full Cster algebra of a free group as a quotient of these algebras. So they're generally very kind of non-amenable. And that's sort of the philosophy one takes when studying these. These, are, these algebras are kind of analogs of group algebras 
associated to some non amenable group, discrete groups, by some sort of generalized Pontryagin duality. Okay. Now let's, uh, so the philosophy is really CR, uh, and maybe for now on, I'm just going to write G for Q ought, so I can save some writing time. Okay, so I'll just write this. So CR of G is really, you should think about this as some sort of reduced C star algebra of some discrete group, but not quite a group, I guess. But anyways, let me say more about that in a second. And this should be the group von Neumann algebra of some sort of object, gamma. And what is gamma? Gamma is going to be a discrete, in precise terms, this is a discrete quantum group. Okay. And it's not going to be amenable in general, unless the size of uh, B is really small. All right, but of course, I mean, these are not group algebras. The co-multiplication is not co-commutative, um, co so you really can't realize these as group algebras. So gamma doesn't really exist uh, as a honest group, and that's a sad thing because when you're looking at group algebras, typically when you analyze the fine structure, internal structure of a group algebra, it's really, at the end of the day, you're doing combinatorics and geometry on the underlying discrete group. And this doesn't exist in this context, so what is the replacement for this? So in this context, uh, the geometry of a discrete group, gamma, is really replaced by a C, rigid C star tensor category, okay? which is essentially the category of some, something, uh, some sort of version of finite dimensional unitary representations. So this is the C star tensor category of uh, representations of G on finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Okay. So if you have a compact group, of course, you get this category, and very nicely, it turns out, for general compact quantum groups, you get a very much analogous uh, tensor category. So I won't say too much about what this is, but I really want to say one thing, which is um, that uh, it turns out that rep G depends very little on uh, B. In fact, as categories, rep, uh, and let me say, I'll put a subscript for the B that gave G, okay? okay. So rep G B1 is the same as a tensor category to rep G B2, uh, precisely when the dimensions of these algebras are the same. So somehow what you should interpret this as saying is that, uh, and this is a result of uh, Van der Venet and uh, Anne de Wright, so Nicholas Van Van der Venet and and to write. Okay, so they proved that as tensor categories, these quantum automorphism groups actually don't depend so much on the B from which they were created. Okay, so B is the finite dimensional C star algebra uh, which we're constructing our quantum group as. Yeah, essentially, yeah. The size of the, the dimension, that is a complete invariant for the representation category, viewed as an abstract rigid C star tensor category. So what this, what this really means at the end of the day is that you can study these things in a very uniform manner. Things like approximation properties, like Hogarth property, 
uh, weak amenability, um, and even looking at things like um, um, things like strong solidity, so the absence of Cartan subalgebras. Okay, so it turns out what is known is that, uh, for example, uh, L infinity from this sort of categorical analysis, generally speaking, this is a 2 1 factor. It's full, no Cartan. Uh, Hogarup property, weakly amenable. and so on. Okay, so there's lots of very nice properties one can prove. Uh, and the proofs are very, in a sense, just dependent on the structure of this category, which turns out to be very simple. Okay, um, so let me just kind of uh, finish by looking at one natural question then, is really how much do, uh, for example, the reduced C star algebras of these quantum groups, GB, and the corresponding 2 1 factors GB depend on B. So, for example, do we get isomorphism if the dimension of B1 is equal to the dimension of B2? Okay. So, are the resulting algebras, let's say the reduced ones, are, you know, it's a little bit easier to look at the full ones because there you have spectra, like lots of characters and things like that, and answer things. But for the reduced algebras, things become more delicate because you get, for example, in the reduced algebras, you get simple C star algebras. Okay, so you can ask, for example, you know, how much does the structure of these algebras depend? Okay, and let me just end with two, two, two results. One is due to Volk. Oops. And what he did was he in the around 2014, I guess it was, he put out a very nice paper where he actually computed the K theory of these reduced C star algebras. Okay. So if B, remember, is this block sum from 1 up to M, M and K, then, for example, the K group, K0 group of this algebra uh, can be computed precisely, and it's actually Z to the uh, number of blocks minus one squared plus one, direct sum, <coughs> uh, a torsion part, uh, ZD, uh, to the power two M minus one, where D is the greatest common divisor of all the sizes of the matrix blocks N1 up to NK. Okay, and so what this K-theory computation does is it actually allows you to distinguish these C-star algebras. So, for example, uh, the reduced algebra of Sn plus is not isomorphic to the reduced algebra of Sm plus for M not equal to N. Okay. And also... Uh, the, um, if you look at uh, the reduced algebra of the quantum automorphism group of MN, a full matrix algebra, this is not going to be isomorphic to the reduced algebra of SN squared plus, okay? Even though the underlying C-star algebras are the same size. So these are different as C-star algebras, okay? The K-theory distinguishes them, which is very nice, okay? Uh, but the natural question here is really how far apart are these algebras? And uh, let me just end with our theorem, which really says that, and I'll state it for the von Neumann algebras, but uh, actually everything works at all levels, reduced, full, and von Neumann algebras. Uh, if two C star algebras, D1 and B2, have the same dimension, then L infinity uh, of GBI for I1 or 2 are finite index subfactors 
of matrix amplifications of each other. Okay, so in a way, you can embed uh, each one into the other as long as the dimension is the same <coughs> by <coughs> finite matrix amplifications. And let me, so I had the word cross product in my title, let me just state the actual thing we prove. It's something stronger than that, namely, um, if, let me state one, one part of it, um, which is if, um, yeah, the dimension of B is let's say capital N, okay? Then there exists uh, action, uh, abelian groups, so, Gamma will be uh, the product of Z and K squared, where K goes from one up to M. And uh, there are actions of <clears throat> gamma on uh, L infinity of Q ought B1 of B, such that, put it right here such that <clears throat> L infinity uh, Q ought B double cross product by gamma is isomorphic to M matrices of size gamma squared over L infinity of Sn plus. Okay. So I'm out of time, so I'll stop here. Um, and uh, let me just say, I mean, what, what this is saying is, of course, you have more than just subfactor inclusions. It's really cross products which witness this. Um, and uh, yeah, the action of this group, why this group? Well, it's actually related to the fact that this C star algebra with this block decomposition is a co-cycle twist of the corresponding abelian C star algebra of the same dimension. And you can witness this by essentially putting the right co-cycle here. And from that, you can deduce the natural action of this group for which this sort of cross product happens. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thanks for your extra time.